the thing I do is push. And if you achieve, and only if you achieve some degree of organization change, now you have subjects who continue to be able to operate that lifestyle because you have this additional income coming in from that, which in this case is largely supplemental. That's a very different world. You could maybe use some of that earnings as we see here to buy some land, to buy a rickshaw and rent it out, to buy some, you know, another shed, a block size, and so forth. And that, that's a very, very different model to one where basically goes at that Chang graph to try to understand like why on earth are these, are these firms not getting bigger as they get older. And one thing he pointed to is that in the US, say, what you have is a lot of delegation and management capacity. So if you're like producing something, as somebody was saying this morning, you know, having interviewed firms and so on, a lot of the owners said, I don't, I can't get any bigger because I can only use my, you know, the, the immediate members of, male members of my family to run the firm. So I think we need to think about how do we create uh, more management capacity that can then be delegated to run firm. Because otherwise you have this 
this, this kind of problem that's one of the issues, is, that's one of the reasons that firms say it's not. I also have not talked about education or about higher education, which are going to be critical in terms of creating that people actually start and run these, uh, these, these, these uh, new industries. And I haven't talked about access to reliable uh, energy, which I think is critical. So working in Big Hard, you realize that basically when you get even a smaller way off the beaten track into the rural areas, into the peri-urban areas, there is no electricity. But what on earth are you going to do if there's no electricity? It's not like you know, the set of production activities you're limited to is, is, is incredibly small. So in this sort of within rural, but also in the urban part, I think we're going to think much more carefully about that. I haven't talked about transportation infrastructure and trade, but I think that's again an area which is uh, uh, particularly important. But I, I do think that there is there's a lot to be said for having a very heavy push on the sort of liberalization deregulation side, which seems to be we started now, but also having a very careful thing about cities. There's something about the manner in which, and it's true whether you're in Pakistan, Bangladesh, or India, that they're just not particularly good places to get uh, uh, businesses running. And so, you know, the, res the response seems to be now that business say, well, the rents are so huge, I'm just going to pick away from the city so I can escape the regulations and the land prices. And with, with Chiang Tai Se at the moment, and, uh, who's at Chicago and Enrico Moretti, we're actually working on Indian cities. And the sort of hypothesis we're working on is, funnily enough, slums might be a good thing. And the reason that slums might be a good thing, so typically we think slums are a horrible thing, uh, is because they're one point of entry for workers into affordable housing, which allows them to access jobs. So the, the, the sort of thesis between the Siemaretti paper in the US is that much of the growth has taken place in places like Tucson in the south, precisely <laughs> because those places could expand their size, bring in workers. So instead of just jacking up the price of property, which is what happens around San Francisco and Manhattan, so all the rents go into property prices, a lot of the rents from productivity is going into employment. And what I'm hoping is that that will happen more and more in the media for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Burgess. Uh, I'm supposed to make my comments now, so let me try making them. Uh, I actually, there are two parts to your talk. One is, if you like, at the lower end of the employment spectrum, 